You open your eyes and see a light once hidden behind darkness and shadows. You see a peace in the serenity and the calm. I see a training for the trial, the enabling of God. You see a storm, waves of suffocating sorrow which threaten to smother you. I see an anchor, a hope. You see mistakes and failures, baggage and pain. I see influence, a microphone. One day you'll open your eyes and see potentials expired, and time is up. But I see the echoes in eternity, a work finally finished. Listen, focus. A light lies hidden beneath the darkness of shadows. See the things unseen. Eternity now, to the eyes of a lion. Yeah, welcome. You guys, as Pastor Brick shared, you've braced, embraced the storm, you've weathered the storm. We're going to be talking about Noah a little bit today. So some of you guys might have had to build an ark, but you made it. And uh, we wanted to show you this video as Pastor Brick was sharing with you. Over the next three weeks, we're doing, we're still in our Love Wind series, Walking Through First Peter, but we're working into kind of a mini series within a series. And so what we're talking about today what I'll be sharing with you is from 1 Peter 3, 8 and on. If you guys want to turn there, we have a connect team. They'd love to get you a Bible. You can raise your hand. And they hand you a Bible. It's a gift from us to you. Feel free to take one. And we're going to be there. We're going to be talking about suffering. Pastor Rob is going to be back with us next week. Continue to pray for him. This, I promise we're not going anywhere. Uh, the ground isn't moving. That's the important thing. Pastor Rob's going to be back next week as Pastor Brick uh, shared Continue to pray for him. You know, I think we sometimes put uh, these uh, athletes, these saints and other athletes into this uh, world as if they are superheroes and not like you and I. And Pastor God has given Pastor Robin an incredible opportunity to minister to people who are on a platform who have regular everyday life struggles and issues like you and I do. And so be praying for Pastor Rob. It is a blessing and an honor to be able to serve alongside him and the other pastors that we serve with. But he's going to be back next week. We're going to continue in 1 Peter on November 1st. And we're going to be sharing again about suffering. And then the video you just saw is a friend of ours. His name is Pastor Levi Lusco. He's a pastor in Montana. And he's recently written a book called Through the Eyes of a Lion. And uh, that's kind of the promotion for that. We are going to be, as Pastor Rob shared last week, at four gatherings. We're going from 2 to 4 on November 8th. So we're here at 9 a.m. and 11 a.m. And then at the Art Center in, in Orleans at 5 p.m. and 7 p.m. And what's unique and important about this is that this Through the Eyes of a Lion book is the story that Pastor Lusco and his family went through. And so the, you saw the little girl at the end of the, uh, the video. The little girl was uh, his wife and his daughter. And she was, I think, four, around that age, four or five. And one night she had an asthma attack and literally died in his arms. And so he goes on to write this book to talk about suffering and to talk about the challenges and struggles that we face as humans. But he talks about that when we do that, we learn things about ourselves and God shows us things about himself. And so it's going to be a powerful uh, testimony from, um, from Pastor Levi Lusco. I'd encourage you guys to be here. I would encourage you, we have opened up a ton of space by going to four gatherings. We want to continue to reach more people. And if I asked every single one of you in this room, if you'd ever struggled with suffering there's a really good chance that you would raise your hand, right? I mean, there's, there's the, that old adage that there's two things that everyone experiences, right? Death and taxes. And both of those are, uh, that's persecution and suffering, right? No. But the reality is, is that as a human being, one of the things that we deal with and struggle with is the fact of suffering. And so 
Pastor Lusko's testimony and message on November 8th is going to be an incredible opportunity for you to bring friends that are far from Jesus, that don't know Jesus, for them to hear about a story that might be very similar to theirs, yet Jesus is in the middle of it. And they need to know about that gospel. So I'd encourage you now, reach out to your friends, reach out to your family, invite them to November 8th for them to be there. But we're going we're gonna to dive into this, this text. We're going to be in 1 Peter 3, 8 through 4, 6. What I want to do before we jump into this text is I want to give you two truths and two questions. Because I think at the end of the day, we need to, there, there's a reality that we need to hang our hat on these truths and these questions because you and I, as human beings, the suffering that we experience levels the playing field, right? There are things in life that sometimes you're here and this person's here or you're farther along and this person's there and you're like, I just wish I could get there or I'm not like this person. At the end of the day, it doesn't matter who you are. You could be Drew Brees, you could be anybody and you're going to struggle and deal with suffering. And so here are these two truths that I want you to write down and I want you to keep in the back of your mind as we move forward. Number one, the, the, the first truth is this, God is good and in control. God is good and in control. Some of you guys need to know that, and that's kind of like the whole takeaway for everything, and that's fine, because that's an important truth. God is good and in control. Number two, we suffer not because of God, but because of sin. We suffer not because of God, but because of sin. Now, this is really important, because the suffering that Pastor Lusco is going to talk about, and some of the suffering that Peter talks about is very different. And all of us encounter different types of suffering in our lives. The suffering that Peter is talking about in 1 Peter is that Christians are being persecuted and ridiculed for their faith. Because they say, I worship and follow Jesus, people are mocking them and ridiculing them and later in history are going to be killed for their faith. Pastor Lusco experienced death. Now, let me tell you that at the end of the day, death is a symptom of sin. Adam and Eve are in the garden. They're perfect. God has made things perfect. They choose to disobey God, eat of the fruit, and because of that, sin, death, everything comes into our lives. And so regardless of what we want to do, you and I are sinners separated from God and will experience death. That's one of the things that is all in common. Every single one of us in this room will die. Now, I know this isn't very uh, that positive yet, so, but it's, we're going to get there. And so whether people are committing sin against us, because that's suffering sometimes. Sometimes people mistreat you, maybe because of your faith, maybe for no reason of your faith. They, 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 they cause you suffering and persecution. Sometimes the suffering that we experience is just because we live in a fallen world. The fact that his daughter died unexpectedly and early is not because of anything that he did or his wife did or she did, but simply because you and I live in a fallen world where sin reigns. And then sometimes we bring suffering on ourselves. We make stupid decisions, we do stupid things, and because of that there are consequences for our sin. But what I want you to know is that God is good and in control And we suffer not because of God, but because of sin. Those are important truths. Now, here are the two questions. And I want you to keep these in the back of your mind as well. Number one, do you know that Jesus suffered for you? Do you know that Jesus suffered for you? Number two, are you willing to suffer for Jesus? Because here's, here's the thing, the questions are important because there's one of two people in this room. You could divide it exactly by this question. You either know and love Jesus or you do not. 
And for those of you that have come and you're searching and you're seeking and you want to know about this Jesus thing and what church is and what, who Christians are and man, you, you've never liked Christians before, but you're coming because you're interested and you want to get an idea, is, is all Christians crazy and weird and treat people poorly or are they actually kind and nice like the Bible says they're supposed to be? And for you, I want you to know that Jesus came and lived and died and suffered for you. Now, for us as Christians, that's an important truth that we're going to come back to. But what I also want us to know, for those of us in this room that know and love Jesus, do you know, that? Or, and if you ask yourself this question, are you willing to suffer for Jesus? Now, what I'm not asking you to do is go out and do something really stupid so you can suffer for Jesus. Jesus didn't ask us to do those kinds of things. But if suffering comes along the way, or is your heart, is your soul prepared and ready to suffer for Jesus? Because that's what Peter's going to talk about. So let's open up our Bibles and let's read this passage. It's on the screen as well. 1 Peter 3, 8 through 4, 6. This is what Peter writes to the church. Finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, and a tender heart and a humble mind. Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless. For to this you were called that you may obtain a blessing for, and he quotes here, whoever desires to love life and see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears open to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Now who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled, but in your hearts honor Christ the Lord as holy. Always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect. Having a good conscience so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison. We've got some fun minor topics to talk about in this passage as well that you're going to see. Because they formerly did not obey, when God's patience waited in the days of Noah... While the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers, having been subjected to him. Since, therefore, Christ suffered in the flesh... Arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. For whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, so as to live for the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. For the time that has passed suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do, living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatry. Those all sound like fun things. When was the last time we talked about orgies in the church? Sorry. That's as far as I'll go. With respect to this, they are surprised when you do not join them in the same flood of debauchery and they malign you. But they will give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead, for this is why the gospel was preached even to those who are dead, that though judged in the flesh the way people are, they might live in the spirit the way God does. So here's what I want to do. I want, as we talk about suffering, remember, keep the the truths and the questions in the back of your mind. And here's what I want to give you. I want to, to tell you this. Love wins when we do these things. 
So number one, love wins when we honor Christ despite our suffering. Love wins when we honor Christ despite our suffering. Now, what's important in that point is this. In all of these points that I'm going to share with you today, I'm not negating the fact that suffering is going to go away. Until the day you and I die, we will struggle with suffering. We might go through seasons where life is beautiful and perfect and grand, and then a season of suffering is going to come. But what I want you to see is that despite the season, to, despite when things are going to come, you and I are to honor Christ despite that suffering. And so this is the very thing that he says in verse 15. Peter, he, he writes all of these things, and we're going to go through some of them, but in 15, he makes his point clear, and he says this, but in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord is holy. What does it mean to honor Christ as holy? At the very beginning of this passage, in 1 Peter 3, 8 through like 14, he lays out all of these things. And he says things like, have brotherly love, care for one another, be humble. At the same time, he says to those people, when people come to revile you, when they come to persecute you and tell you you're a loser because you follow Jesus, take it. Bear it. Deal with it. You're not supposed to turn around and be like, well, you're a loser too. I mean, that's a terrible comeback. Don't, don't even use that, right? I wanted to say whatever, you know, I'm rubber, you're glue, whatever, you know, you know that one? But that's terrible too. But what God is saying is that to honor Christ requires an active and passive obedience. Active in that there is a particular way in which you and I are to live our lives. And part of honoring Christ in our suffering is caring for one another. It's loving one another. It's these things, having unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart and a humble mind. It's this passive in that you and I are to take sometimes the suffering and the reviling that, that people bring because of our faith. Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling. This is what Jesus says, Matthew 5, 38 through 48. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him too. Give to the one who begs from you and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven, for He makes His sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust. That's a truth you and I need to deal with. Good things happen to bad people. Bad things happen to good people. That's what Jesus is saying. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do, you, do not even the tax collectors do the same? They're terrible, crooked people, these tax collectors in Jesus' time. And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same. You, therefore, must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Jesus is laying down a hard truth, right? That's what he's doing in the Sermon on the Mount. In the Sermon on the Mount, he's saying, this is what you've heard the law to be. But I'm taking it up a notch and I'm telling you, if they hit you, turn your other cheek. If they want to sue you, give them your things. You think you, in loving your brother, loving those who believe like you is enough, love the ones that hate you. Love the ones who treat you like dirt. That's what Jesus is saying. That's what Peter is saying in 1 Peter 3. Now here's what's interesting. So he goes on in, in 1 Peter 3.15, but in your hearts honor Christ as the Lord. And now we always use this as like verse 15, the end of 15 into 16, to be ready to like really defend the faith, talk about the, you know, the apologetics of the faith. Let me tell you why God exists. Let me tell you why Jesus rose from the grave. And those things are all great and important and necessary. But what Peter is saying here is that when you honor Christ, you better be prepared to give a defense for why you honor Christ. Because people are going to ask. 
People are going to wonder why when someone says worshiping a guy who lived and died 2,000 years ago is stupid, why would you do that? People are going to want to know. And that's what Peter says. So when you honor Christ, when you set Him as Lord, that's what it means to honor Christ as Lord is that you submit yourself under His authority and Lordship. He's your boss. He's the one that you are called to listen to and surrender to. And so, despite suffering, honoring Christ, what that means is it doesn't matter where Jesus calls you. It doesn't matter what Jesus tells you to do. You obey. Even when it gets tough, obey. And when you obey, people are going to ask, what is wrong with that person? And then, with gentleness and respect, you share why you have the hope that you do. Some of us need to ask this question of ourselves. Why aren't we suffering? Now, I'm not telling you right now to go to Syria, wear a Christian t-shirt, and carry a big cross and say, I'm for Jesus. Right? There are places in this world that if you do that, you will die. And Jesus isn't calling you to be stupid. Right? Do you know that, right? Jesus isn't calling you to be stupid. That's really important. But what Jesus is, is He might be calling you to something specific. Some of you as believers, He might be calling you to that closed country where to even say the name of Jesus is blasphemy and you will be killed. Ask yourself that. God, where do you want me to go? Who do you want me to be with? What do you want me to do with my life? In reality, in our country, in our day and age, you and I are not going to be killed for our faith. And that's not something for us to be ashamed of. God in His own sovereignty and choice has placed you in the United States of America. God's choice for bringing you here and birthing you here is not wrong. So don't have this complex and be ashamed of the fact that you were born and raised in America and now you've got to leave. That's not what God might be saying to you. But here's the reality. Is that the Christian faith is becoming more and more and more offensive in America. And so I don't think that you and I today are going to be killed. I don't know in the next five years if you and I are going to be killed for our faith. But I will tell you what's happening now and what will continue to happen. You will continue to be marginalized. You will continue to experience this pushback on your faith and the the implications for your faith. And here's the question that you have to ask is that if you're not experiencing some sort of suffering, marginalization, those sorts of things, why not? Why do you not have opportunities to share about the hope that you have? And listen, I'm I'm, I'm saying this and I'm asking that question because numero uno is not experiencing marginalization for their faith. No one is saying, quit talking about Jesus, Dustin. You're annoying me. But Peter is making an assumption that you are going to have, you and I are going to have opportunities to talk about Jesus. So hopefully you have an opportunity to talk about Jesus. Are you taking and capitalizing on those opportunities? Because in that moment, whether you experience suffering or not, you're given an opportunity to share the hope that you have, to share the gospel that Jesus came, lived, died, and resurrected for you and for me and for the world. So love wins when we honor Christ despite our suffering. Number two, love wins when we trust Christ in his suffering. Verses 18 through 22. I'm not going to go back and read it, but I want to unpack just a few of the things that happens in this passage. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison. We're going to talk about that in just a second. Love wins when we trust Christ in our suffering, or in His suffering. 
What, what, what Peter is doing here is he's reminding this church, anything that you're experiencing, the person that you have placed all of your faith and trust in in your life has also experienced those very same things. In fact, to a worse degree. And so the things that, that Peter says is that there was unjust suffering. Christ suffered once. And then Peter says, the righteous for the unrighteous. The Bible talks about that Jesus was sinless, that he was perfect, that he did not sin as a human being, and yet he suffered for the unrighteous. Do you know who the unrighteous are? You can raise your hand. It's you and me. And so Jesus endured unjust suffering. If you think the, the suffering and the persecution and the struggles that you have are unjust, look to Jesus. Number two, we repent and believe in Christ for salvation. We trust in Christ and His suffering because He provided a substitutionary atonement. Big words for that. Christ swapped His place with us and made us one with God. That's what He says, that, it, that He was the righteous for the unrighteous. This divine swap. That when Jesus died and when we confess and believe in Jesus the righteousness, the perfection that is in Christ becomes ours. The sin, the penalty for sin became Christ's. So Christ died for people who didn't even deserve to die. He lived a life and died a death for unrighteous sinners like you and me. But there was a purpose in this that He might bring us to God. The only way that you and I can be reconciled with God, atonement, it means at one mint, meaning being made one with God. That God created us. This is what we talk about in the gospel, God's creation. God's creation is that he created everything perfectly and that man and woman walked with God and they had perfect communion with God. They were created for that. But because of our condition, the fact that we chose to eat of that fruit, and because of that choice of two individuals, you and I are now inflicted with sin. And we have a condition that we cannot get back to a right relationship with God without God Himself. And that's where God's provision comes in. That God made a way that there had to be a perfect sacrifice that was perfect and yet human like us. The only way to do that is to have a God-man in Jesus. He is both fully God and fully man. And then he died on a cross satisfying the wrath and penalty for us. And then our response. All of these things that God has done for us, we have a response to repent and believe. That's exactly what he kind of says here. Some of you guys are you know, maybe a little confused and you've been around vintage for a while and it says, but baptism saves. I didn't think baptism saved. And that's what Peter is saying is that it doesn't save. Verse 21, baptism which corresponds to this now saves you. Now I want you to hear, that's what he says, not as a removal of dirt from the body. There's nothing about the water that's any special or any particular thing. It's not been blessed or anything like that. The water can't remove sin. But it's an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And at the heart of it, what Peter is saying is that baptism is this outward testimony of inward change that if God, if you have repented and believed this appeal to a good conscience... Do you know the only way that you and I can have a good conscience before God is through Christ? Only because of what Christ has done for us. And the Bible talks about repenting and believing, turning from our sin, believing in Jesus. And then we are baptized as an appeal to that conscience that, look world, look God, this is what I am doing. I've repented and believed and now I'm getting baptized. I'm being baptized to show a physical act for a spiritual act that God has saved me. 
And it's not the act of baptism that saves, but through the resurrection of Jesus Christ at the very end there. That because Jesus came, lived, and died, and rose from the grave, you and I can have salvation. You need to know that. Whether you're a believer or lost, I pray that as we talk about this, if you do not know Jesus, I pray that you would come to believe the gospel, of what the gospel is. That you would repent and believe, that you would trust. Because suffering, it does, none of this matters without Christ. We're going to talk, there's no hope without Jesus. The suffering that we experience, whether it's brought on us or we do it ourselves, whether it's because of Jesus or because of death or, or disease or anything like that, without Christ, there's no hope. We come here because we've got hope. The last little thing that I want to say is Jesus went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison. Did Jesus descend into hell after his death? The Apostles' Creed, if you're familiar with the creeds, talks about Jesus descending into hell. We don't see that phrase until 390 A.D. And so what I want to encourage you is that Jesus didn't descend into hell when he died. But what Peter is referring to is that he's standing victorious over Satan and his demons to say, I have conquered sin, death, and hell. Love wins when we honor Christ despite our suffering, trust Christ in his suffering. And lastly, become like Christ because of our suffering. 1 Peter 4, 1 through 6 talks about this. How do we become like Christ in our suffering? We do not live for our sinful desires. We live for the will of God. And so what Peter lays out here is that, listen, you are no different or were no different than all of those people that are ridiculing you and, and persecuting you. You were just like them prior to coming to faith. But now, because Jesus has saved you, it is your responsibility in the power of the Spirit to live for God. And that part of suffering, part of the, part of the reason God brings suffering in our lives and challenges in our lives is not just to say, man, I want to see how they respond to this. This is going to be fun. Let's play a game. It's not. Because at the, what, what God does... God allows suffering and persecution in our lives to make us look more like Jesus. Your number one goal in life, if you are a believer in Jesus, is to look more like Jesus. So whatever it is, whether it's singleness, whether it's marriage, whether it's prosperity, whether it's suffering, whether it's school, whether it's a job, whatever it is, God has placed that in your life to look more like Jesus. Jesus. And what Peter is saying is that in this passage in particular, the best way you can begin to look more like Jesus is to turn from sin and live for Jesus. So all those things the Gentiles do, don't do them. And then he says this, and how many of you guys experience this? Verse 4, uh, 1 Peter 4, 4. With respect to this, they are surprised when you do not join them in the same flood of debauchery and they malign you. There's, a, there's something to be said for living like Christ because when you do, the world is, not, the world is just dumbfounded. Like, why would you not do that? Why would you skip a saint's game and come to church? Why would you not go to that party? Why would you pray for your coworkers? Jesus. At the end of that passage, Peter writes, For this is why the gospel was preached even to those who are dead, that though judged in the flesh the way people are, they might live in the Spirit the way God does. Some people believe that this refers to that Jesus uh, preached to these Old Testament saints, or those in hell even, that He went down into hell and preached. But what this actually refers to is the fact that people who have heard and accepted the gospel have died. There are people in Peter's lifetime 
who have believed and come to faith and experienced death. But they're not fully dead. They're alive in Christ. So love wins when we honor Christ despite our suffering, trust Christ in His suffering, and become like Christ because of our suffering. I want you to catch this truth. Although we suffer, we should look to Jesus as an example in how to suffer as we await our future hope. There's one thing that I cannot promise you. I can't promise you that life was going to be any easier for you. In fact, there's probably a better chance that it's going to get a whole lot tougher. People you love are going to die. People that you thought cared about you are going to stab you in the back. Your friends who thought they cared for you, when you share the gospel with them, they no longer want to be your friends. Maybe God's calling you to Iran to share the gospel, and you die because of the gospel. I can't promise you that things are going to get any better. But what I can promise you is the future hope that we have. That when we look to Christ... There is great hope for you and I. You imagine, no one had ever come back to life before with Jesus, right? There were a couple people he raised the dead, but they knew that they were going to die again. Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead. Guess what? Lazarus is going to die again in the Gospels. Jesus has been proclaiming this incredible message that he's got hope and salvation and he's going to free people. And he gets arrested and he dies a death of a criminal. Now, what do all the disciples do? Man, they run. I don't want to do that. I didn't sign up for this. What happens three days later? Holy cow. A man rises from the dead. You guys ever seen that before? I mean, no one has, except for those people who witness Jesus. So life is not going to get any easier for us, potentially. Suffering could come, but listen, there is great hope in Jesus Christ. That we have a resurrection to look forward to. That the person that we worship and, and adore and serve is not dead, but alive. And that because he came back from the dead... You and I, though we will die and experience death and suffering and persecution, will be made alive with Christ. Is anybody else excited about that? Okay. Without that, there is no hope. So here's how I want us to respond. I've got three questions. Number one, will you trust Christ? I've already talked to you about the gospel. Repent and believe. There's nothing stopping you from right now praying and crying out to God, saying, I need you. Repent of your sins, turn from your sins, and believe in Jesus. Secondly, be baptized. Baptism doesn't save, but it is an incredible outward testimony of what God has done for you. We've got a sign-up sheet at that connect table right there. We're hoping to do a baptism next week. And I would love to be able to talk with you and meet with you about being baptized. Whether God has saved you today or you haven't been baptized yet, but you know and love Jesus. Sign up, come and talk to us. We'd love to talk with you. For those of us that know and love Jesus, look to Jesus for an example and comfort. Life's not going to get any easier, but Jesus is there. Jesus suffered like we suffer, was, yet was without sin, and desires to hear us. We are not, hear me, we are not bothering God when we cry out to God. He desires to hear us. Number two, will you honor Christ? Will you honor Christ? 
Where in your life are you not, I'm sorry, where in your life are you not submitting to Christ's lordship? What is Jesus calling you to that you are disobeying? Submit. Honor him. Number three, will you become like Christ? Where in your life are you not fleeing from sin? Where in your life are you not living for God's will? Will you trust Christ? Will you honor Christ? Will you become like Christ? I'm going to ask Robert and the band to come forward. Those who are uh, serving communion to come forward as well. I want us to do something a little different today. We're going we're gonna to sing and we're going to take communion. I want everyone to pull out their phone. It's okay. You can do it. Some of you already been doing it anyways. I want you to find somebody on your phone. If you're a believer, I want you to find somebody on your phone that is a committed and trusted friend, someone that's in maybe in your community group, small groups of people that meet throughout the week, uh, someone that you know that will hold you accountable. And I want you to do this while we respond as Robert begins playing. You can do it now if you want. I want you to text the name of one lost friend to that person. And I want you to ask that person, A, to pray with you, but to hold you accountable for having a conversation with that lost friend. That I've got this friend, this is his or her name. Give the name. I'm praying for them this week. I'm going to share the gospel with them this week. Next week, I need you to ask, how did it go? You and I, we need to be able to share this truth. If we believe that this hope is real, let's share it. And I'm not saying to text this name because you need to be a legalist, and, but at the end of the day, we, you and I need some accountability. And how incredible it is that you have a friend that's praying for you and praying for that person that needs to hear the gospel. Number two, I want you to text them this as well. I want you to text them one struggle, something that you're suffering going through, or some sin that you're battling. And I want you to text them and ask that they would pray for you as you deal with that struggle, as you deal with that sin, as you deal with that temptation. Because here's what I want you to see is that God has called us to some incredible stuff. Honoring Christ despite suffering, trusting in Christ Christ through His suffering, becoming like Christ through our suffering is not easy. You and I need one another. And so right now, I want you to do that. Before you take communion, I want you to do that. For those of you that do not know Jesus, you're searching, you're asking, I pray you still take your phone out. Here's what I want you to do. We have a phone number. They're going to put it up on the screen. If you need prayer or you have questions or you want to talk to somebody about Jesus, text that number. Our pastors see it. We'd love to be able to talk with you. And that's how I want us to respond. For those of you that know and love Jesus, We're also going to respond by taking communion. How appropriate. As we talk about suffering, as we talk about the death of Christ, that we can trust in it. And so what we're going to do as we respond for those that know and love Jesus, that have partook in His death through faith and repentance, you're going to come up and break off a piece of the bread and dip it in the juice or the wine. The bread representing the body of Christ that was shed, or the broken, if you can shed flesh. The the blood, the juice of the wine symbolizing the blood of Christ that was shed for us. And I pray again that all of us would seek Christ. Because just as constant as suffering is in our life, Jesus is even more constant. Would you guys stand with me? Let's pray.
Father, we pray and ask in the name of Jesus, God, that you would move us to action. God, that you would move us to make incredible decisions for you, God, whether it's for the first time in our lives accepting Christ, repenting and believing, or you know, for the first time, really being called out to share our faith and our gospel and being obedient to do that. God, living a life being challenged to look more like Jesus than the world. God, move us. Do not allow us to stay the same after meeting and seeing you. So may we respond to your call. May we be obedient now. It's in Christ's name we pray.